to our keynote speaker, we're honored to have Nancy Cox here from Vanderbilt, and she's going to tell us about her recent work looking at genetic contribution to gene regulation and how learning about that can help us to understand about the role of genetics in human traits and human disorders. So please join me in welcoming Nancy. Thanks. Thanks. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. This is such a great meeting, and um, I've been really looking forward to sharing some of the newest findings, but I really want to get some feedback from an audience like this on and, um, and more collaborations with my ENCODE colleagues, because while this project was very much grounded in and started by research that we were doing in GTEx, it is very much going to end up in um, <laughs> deeply looking at ENCODE. So, what I'm going to do today, so I, I think over the, in the, about a year ago, I was talking about initial results in about 5,000 subjects um, from BioView. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about today are results of studies that we've been doing with our predict scan methodology in about 20,000 BioView subjects on our way to about 120,000. Um, so there'll be some novel gene to phenotype discoveries and more on the continuum um, from Mendelian to common disease um, in a number of different dimensions. Some new ways that I think we have to, um, to really get more kinds of insights into biological mechanisms of disease and new big picture biology that relates to the medical phenome as a concept in and of itself separate from individual diseases. So just to review, um, a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is centered on this analysis uh, tool that we had worked on through GTEx called PredictScan. Um, the idea is, it, you know, when we measure gene expression, there's some component of that that is entirely genetically determined. Lots, uh, most of it is, is attributable to other kinds of exposures and to the feedback of traits and diseases on what we measure as transcript levels. Um, but, but we can use what we measure in something like GTEx to develop SNP-based predictors of gene expression that then we can test um, with phenotype. So this is already published uh, last year in Nature Genetics and all of the software, it's on your, it's on your bingo sheet, is actually um, <laughs> publicly available in GitHub um, and continuous, continuously updated as we're able to get more data from, from GTEx for building the predictors. So we use GTEx as a reference panel to build these prediction equations um, and just create a, a really big database um, with, for each gene in each tissue, all of the SNP predictors that come into the prediction equation and the associated weights. Um, we're using elastic net for building the predictions. But that means, so once that's created, in any data set where we just have the genome variation, and that can be GWAS level, it can be whole genome sequencing, um, we can essentially impute transcript levels for each gene in each tissue and associate that calculated endophenotype with our traits of interest, in this case, the medical phenome that we have in BioView. And it has, in any given tissue, there are only about four to 9,000 genes that have really high quality prediction. But across all of the tissues that we measure in GTEx, we're getting now high quality prediction in about 18,000 genes. So, um, and, and this is with just the first half of the GTEx data that will come in. So that will improve over time. We've also not, used um, ENCODE annotations in this first um, pass through in building the predictions. That's something that I think um, people are looking at and working on. So the quality of the prediction may improve as we can include more information from ENCODE annotations in building the predictors. Um, plus, we've only built cis predictors of gene expression at this point. Um, as GTEx matures and we have larger samples, um, we expect to be able to use at least the top performing trans uh, biology in the prediction equations. 
So this is all being applied now in the context of the biobank at Vanderbilt University. So Vanderbilt built their own electronic health record more than 20 years ago, and there's a, a clinical data warehouse, as it were, that we call the synthetic derivative. That's a de-identified and conti continuously updated enriched image of the EMR. There's actually a lot of correction that comes in, so outlier variables um, get, uh, get looked at hard and corrected. And that's, that's about two and a half million subjects today. Um, we have DNA on more than 215,000 subjects with GWAS level genotyping on about 20,000 and exome chip date on about 36,000 today. Um, but we're in the midst of some, some bigger projects that'll get us by this time next year to dense genotypes in about 120,000 and whole genome or exome sequencing on thousands to tens of thousands and that's gonna be decided by some of the lots of grants that are in the system now. Um, and, and we'll have DNA on more than 225,000. The synthetic derivative will have more than three million observations. These are really rich data. So just the synthetic derivative alone for, for learning about the phenome is a fantastic resource. Um, but, but being able to look at DNA samples uh, with genome interrogation on tens of thousands to more than 100,000 is, is, is of great value. But the really cool thing is the phenome. I, I had no idea before coming to Vanderbilt how how much more science, how much more biology we can learn about disease by being able to look at the entire medical phenome as opposed to individual diseases. And I think, so Josh Denny, who conceived the concept of the phenome-wide association study, um, people have thought of it as kind of a curiosity, a, a cool little twist, flipping a GWAS on its head. It, it, it's way more than that, and I'm going to try to convince you by the end of the day that we can learn much more disease biology considering the phenome in its entirety than looking at one disease at a time. So the phenome-wide association study uh, original concept was taking a single SNP that's either, say, the top GWAS finding for Alzheimer's and looking at um, all of the phenome associations with that one SNP, or taking a, a SNP that's a loss of function uh, variant in a particular gene and, and looking at the entire phenome associated with that. When I say the entire phenome, um, Josh Denny, uh, who's one of the 41 members of the Department of Biomedical Informatics at Vanderbilt, that's a fantastic resource for doing phenome studies, has set this up so, so that the tens of thousands of diagnostic codes um, get boiled down into about 1,600 phenome codes that we look at. And, and those have been um, set up to be much more, uh, there's much more information in those than in medical diagnoses. So it takes multiple visits to instantiate a diagnosis, for example. Um, it's not, so we also have a number of algorithms for getting to 95% sensitivity and specificity for any given single diagnosis. So this is not that really fine-grained look at a single diagnosis, but it's a much more nuanced look at these 1,600 codes um, that, that boil down from the tens of thousands. Um, and uh, when we do FIWAS, there's a hierarchical organization. So for example, if you're looking at the phenotype um, end-stage renal disease, in the controls, you don't have kidney failure not otherwise specified, uh, kidney transplant, kidney dialysis. So, so all of the related phenotypes are not used at all in the analysis, um, your control set um, is, is a group of phenotypes not on the sort of hierarchical uh, diagnostic um, spectrum of the phenotype that you're looking at. So keep in mind about 1,600 diagnostic codes. Now of those, so we're, we're not looking at anything that doesn't have at least um, 30 individuals, and I, I actually don't 
look at anything myself that doesn't have at least 50 individuals. So that then, that actually boils down to closer to 1,300. And then a subset of those are um, normal pregnancy, normal delivery, well child care, you know, sort of part and parcel, uh, work physicals. They're codes for billing, um, they're, they're diagnostic entities, but they're not disease. Um, and so it's, it's less than 1,300 codes actually that, that, that we're reporting out on. And what we're doing is building this gene by medical phenome catalog. So we're doing not FIWAS on a single SNP, but on these predicted gene expression phenotypes. And, and trying to create a comprehensive gene by medical phenome catalog. You can think of it as essentially knocking down each gene in each tissue and reading out the consequences of that across the entire medical phenome, upregulating each gene in each tissue and reading out the consequences of that across the entire medical phenome. And of course, we're not manipulating the human beings to do that. We're using natural variation and how we've, we've used GTEx to learn how to read the natural variation and translate that into these imputed, genetically predicted transcript levels. And we think this makes BioView a really cool discovery engine. And it, it actually works on the larger scale. So the deviance of the transcriptome um, is, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you, the only <laughs> tale of a distribution you ever want to be in is this one which is the tally of the number of transcript levels where people are at least three standard deviations from the mean, plus or minus, okay? So when you're low here, that's a good thing um, because this uh, deviance of the transcriptome is significantly correlated with the burden of medical disease, the number of phenome codes people accumulate in their lifetime. So you can see while most people in BioView have relatively small numbers of phenome codes, 15 or 20. There are plenty of people with very large numbers. The, when you have a chronic disease, you just accumulate phenome codes like crazy because disease begets disease. And there are, there are plenty of people with, yes, very large numbers. I've talked before about some of the early findings. So in just 5,000 subjects in BioView, we saw that the reduced genetically predicted expression of this gene, GRIC5, was associated with many different eye phenotypes. None of these are genome-wide significant. So if we do a Bonferroni correction for the, the number of genes we look at with quality prediction and the number of phenome codes um, and, and, and the number of tissues where we have quality prediction, um, none of these would meet genome-wide criteria for significance, but it's a really interesting pattern, and if the phenotype were just eye disease, yeah, it would meet genome-wide criteria for significance. In less time than I could get the analyses done on the next 15,000 people, they'd knocked it out in zebrafish with notable eye phenotypes and have been able to show um, in subsequent studies of zebrafish embryo eyes that the protein product of this gene is very highly expressed in all of the parts of eye that give rise to the particular eye phenotypes that we looked at. So it's highly expressed in the lens. It's highly expressed in parts of the eye where retinal detachment is going to be an issue. Um, it for, it's highly expressed in the cells that form the sheath, the myelin sheath around the optic nerve um, and in parts of the eye that control fluid dynamics. So the association of the reduced expression, genetically predicted expression of GRIC5 with the different eye diseases makes sense given where the protein product is highly expressed. And they've now been following um, some of these into adulthood and seeing little zebrafish with cataracts and things. So it's a really cool um, uh, biological validation. But it, to my mind, the ultimate biological validation of what we're discovering is not with model system knockdown and knockout experiments. It's with the human knockdown and knockout experiments. Mendelian diseases give us a window into human phenotypes that are observed with large-scale knockout of a particular gene across all tissues. And 
we definitely are picking up with the reduced genetically predicted expression of Mendelian disease genes, the phenotypes that you see associated with the Mendelian disease. So there is this continuum from loss of function mutations to deleterious amino acid substitutions to just reduced expression of these same genes. For example, um, here's one nuclear factor one X type. Actually, autosomal dominant mutations at this gene are associated with two different Mendelian diseases, Marshall Smith syndrome and Soto syndrome two. They have quite similar features, but some differences. So accelerated bone formation, um, which then you see as fractures in the kids, diminished muscle tone, especially in the upper body, that lead to breathing difficulties. Um, the larynx and trachea are characterized as floppy. Um, they have characteristic facial features, um, especially for the eyes and blue sclera, mental and motor delays, um, speech may be absent or abnormal, intellectual disability and impairment. With Soto syndrome too, you see overgrowth in childhood, um, but a prominent um, sco scoliosis or curvature. They also have distinctive facial features and muscle weakness, but more congenital anomalies, so congenital anomalies of the kidney, heart, eyes, ears, um, and then sometimes deafness are, is reported. They ha have some benign tumors, low-grade malignancies, but not increased rates of cancer for the most part, um, but may have epilepsy and seizures, intellectual disability, behavior problems, and specific speech and language disorders. Stuttering was mentioned, other speech and language disorders. Uh, some features, characteristics sometimes of autism, the insistence on sameness um, that you see with the OCD, but also ADHD, et cetera. So, so, so these phenotypes reduced genetically, and, and it's the breathing difficulties that led to early death of these kids until more recently when physicians were much more aggressive treating the breathing difficulties that arise because of the muscle weakness. They would get um, uh, respiratory infections, very serious respiratory infections. Across GTEx, the genes very highly expressed in the brain, um, but you also notice um, muscle, and it's highly expressed in um, cervix uh, and uterus and, um, and some in the heart. So in the red, I show some of the features. So this is just what I'm showing sort of fully. It's the top signals. Um, for reduced predicted expression of NFIX in blood. I'm going to show you some of the other tissues in a second. In the red are classic features of one or the other or both of the disorders. So you see the cardiac and circulatory congenital anomalies. Um, the right way to think about statistical genome-wide statistical significance with a Bonferroni correction, conservative Bonferroni correction, is something in the range of uh, 3.8 times 10 to the minus 8, although uh, because of the correlations among phenotypes, if we do permutations, it might be something like 7 times 10 to the minus 7, but think of it as 3.8, 3.4 times 10 to the minus 8. So uh, cardiac and circulatory congenital anomalies, um, some of the eye congenital anomalies, um, and but then there's all these other features. So we see congenital anomalies of the esophagus not reported. Um, to be a feature of this disease, but wouldn't be surprising because by definition Mendelian diseases are rare, fully characterized in some handful of kids with the disease, and so over time I would be unsurprised if we don't see kids with either or both of those diseases characterized as having congenital anomalies of the esophagus. Um, this is just salivary gland cysts. But it's an interesting phenotype because it's not all that common. It's highly significantly associated with reduced expression of this gene. It might help physicians to get to a canonical diagnosis that, that, that what they're looking at really is about this, this particular gene. Um, but you notice one of the other things that as these kids are living longer lives, parents always want to know is what what's going to happen to my child in the future. And one thing that will happen in all likelihood to the girls who live longer 
is pelvic inflammatory disease because we see that very highly significant asso significantly associated with reduced predicted expression of this gene, which given what this trans trans transcription factor is known to do is not necessary, and where it's expressed highly, is not necessarily surprising. Um, also see the uh, giant cell arteritis and pemphigus and pemphigoid um, associated, and that's um, going to be potentially interesting to see if the kids develop as they um, age. Not clear whether these infections are part of the disease or just a consequence sometimes of the fact that they do have trouble clearing secretions from the lungs because of the muscle weakness. In other tissues, we get the facial weakness. We get pneumonias, which is, you know, the, you know, one of the canonical manifestations of this. You see diseases of the larynx and vocal cords, symptoms of respiratory system. The symbolic dysfunction in speech and language disorder, these are among the top signals for these phenotypes where we don't have that many diagnoses in a healthcare system for these. Um, so to see them come up in a disease characterized by speech and language disorders and intellectual disability is interesting. Disorders of the tympanic membrane. We also see some neural tube defects, which actually, I did find one report of one of these in, I think it was uh, Soto syndrome too. Um, but fractures and kidney anomalies over a range of significance from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 9 see in many, across many tissues and seizures and convulsions and epilepsy. So cardinal features of the disease we see with reduced predicted expression of the gene. And, and this is, so we see it for autosomal dominant disorders, we see it for autosomal recessive, we see it sufficiently that we're creating a database of Mendelian disease genes and the phenotypes associated with them in BioView. Um, as we, as the more and more is done to sequence when we think we don't know what, what Mendelian disease is segregating in a family, it could be useful to look at this and see the expanded set of phenotypes in much larger numbers of individuals with just reduced expression of the gene to see whether um, you might be able to hone in on a gene more rapidly, but also for the outcomes as patients live longer with some of these um, diseases. We're also creating a database of Mendelian genes in waiting because there are hundreds, in, in just the first 20,000, there are hundreds of genes where reduced expression of the gene is associated with multiple congenital anomalies, intellectual disability, and other really bad stuff. And some of these, at least, may be Mendelian disease genes that the Mendelian sequencing centers and undiagnosed diseases network people are looking for. And so having a database where we can, they can look very quickly at the, what phenotypes are associated with the genetically reduced expression and also genetically increased expression. Some of the genes in this category are already Mendelian genes, but where it's loss of function that's driving the known Mendelian disease, and we see increased genetically predicted expression of those, some of those same genes associated with, as I say, many congenital anomalies, but not the same ones, and other bad things. So there might be other kinds of mutations, gain of function mutations that could give rise to some of these. Maybe one of the few ways to predict what kinds of phenotypes would arise with de novo mutations in genes where we don't normally see uh, germline mutations uh, at all. But it, it could have improved diagnoses and allows us to, to iterate between the phenotypes in the undiagnosed diseases network and the Mendelian sequencing studies. They'll often re-phenotype the people um, when they think they know what the disease is, looking for the, the gene is, looking for phenotypic manifestations that might have been missed. And these are, these are some ways that, that um, we hope we can help with some of those. But to drive home what I think could be a surprising new idea with respect to translation in the common variant spectrum, I want to focus on a zinc transporter that's a cause of autosomal recessive acrodermatitis and teropathica. So this is, as I say, an autosomal recessive disease associated with this blistering skin condition around all openings in the body but also with chronic diarrhea and gastritis, serious behavioral problems, anemia. It was fatal in early childhood, un like 
five, four or five years of age until the gene was cloned and found to be a zinc transporter. Five days after zinc supplementation, the rash clears. Within a week, the diarrhea and gastritis clear. The behavioral problems are reported to be gone um, in the first month. So, so here's a Mendelian disease where we have an effective therapy. Um, this gene is very highly expressed in um, intestine, stomach, colon, not surprisingly, skin, not surprisingly, also brain. This is a log base 10 scale. It's really highly expressed um, in the, the gut, brain, skin, um, but also in the thyroid, um, and we'll come back to that, uh, and, and prostate. So again, in the red, you see some of the canonical phenotypes, so the anemia, mineral deficiency, um, Cation Beck disease and iodine hypothyroidism are characterized as phenotypes that can arise in um, mineral deficiencies, including zinc deficiency um, and the gastritis and duodenitis. Um, you see schizophrenia at ten, three times 10 to the minus nine. So the behavioral problems, uh, an interesting um, parallel, but a top association with cardiomyopathy um, so a, a question of, you know, what, if you weren't treated, would these kids eventually have developed cardiomyopathies? You see some benign me neoplasms of female genital organs, um, cervical incompetence. So there was some, some higher expression in both male and female sex organs also. In other tissues, notably skin, you're picking up a lot of different blistering skin conditions. So impetigo, pilonidal cyst, pruritus and, re and related conditions, bullous dermatitis, psoriasis, um, lots of skin conditions that are probably the same skin phenotype but not recognized as the Mendelian skin disease because it doesn't occur at birth but a little later in life and it doesn't have the full set of symptoms. Most people have one of these rather than multiple of them, and in adulthood or, or um, early adulthood even, um, rather than from birth. But you also see type 2 diabetes, um, which has an association with another zinc transporter, acute renal failure, so this is, you see all the kidney failure, uh, acute renal failure, chronic kidney disease, kidney failure not otherwise specified, kidney transplant, renal dialysis, primary pulmonary hypertension, suicidal ideation or attempt, a known consequence of zinc deficiency is cerebral degeneration, and you see that associated. Um, Gallatin crystal arthropathies in a range also. So again, all the canonical features, the diarrhea, gastritis, skin condition, behavioral problems, and these people would likely benefit from zinc supplementation too. They have their three, four standard deviations below the mean, some of them, um, but even people two standard deviations below the mean are at significantly increased risk for all these bad things. And how pissed off would you be if you go through most of your life with a nasty blistering skin condition that is never treated the right way, that you have all of your life, Chronic diarrhea, schizophrenia, I mean, if you knew that there were geneticists realizing that a nickel's worth of zinc could have, might have improved your conditions. So we're looking at starting some trials. So basically going into the GI and derm clinics, trying to identify people who might be seen in both, testing CLIA, just the SNPs that are predictive of the expression of this gene, and um, it's an innocuous therapy. Lots of people take zinc supplementation just to be healthier. So there are dozens of Mendelian diseases that can be treated reasonably effectively with innocuous therapies like vitamin or mineral supplementation or dietary interventions, dozens. And there will be more people with increased risk of bad diseases due to the reduced expression of just those genes, just those dozens of Mendelian genes, then there are people who have any Mendelian disease and are alive today because they're rare. 
This acrodermatitis enteropathica is one in 500,000 live births, but we have more than 5,000 patients in BioView at high risk of kidney failure, cardiomyopathies, not to mention the blistering skin conditions or schizophrenia and chronic diarrhea. So um, the number of people who could benefit from, in this case, zinc supplementation, but in uh, other cases, vitamin supplementation, removing a particular uh, food group from the diet, it's a large number of people. Um, these are relatively modest interventions, and there's real biological support for the idea. It's the same, it's just reduced genetically determined expression of the same gene that gives rise to a Mendelian disorder with these phenotypes. Big picture observations. If we look at the transcriptome coefficient of variation, it's really interesting, like Daniel MacArthur's loss of function tolerant genes have tend to have high coefficients of variations, like Mother Nature's saying, oh yeah, I don't care. You, you can have none, you can have a lot, it doesn't matter how much you have. But Mendelian and mouse embryonic lethal genes actually have narrower coefficients of variation, despite the fact that they are just as heritable as most other genes, and actually these ones tend to be somewhat less heritable. Um, and the phenome burden, so if we tally up, you know, think of a kind of an area under the curve of whether you want to think of add significance into it or just the number of highly significant phenome associations, the phenome burden is way higher down here than it is. In this. We have most genes have no genome-wide significant associations at all, um, and genes that are Mendelian disease genes or have associations with congenital anomalies, intellectual disability, and look like they should be a Mendelian disease gene, also have much more phenome association, much more highly significant phenome association um, in either direction. And there's a class, mouse embryonic lethal genes, that, we, that are not Mendelian disease genes, but are also really highly associated with um, phenome. One of the things I talked about in just the first 5,000 subjects was that there is a genetic opposite to at least some diseases. This is what the genetically predicted expression of many of the transcriptomes look like in 20,000 people in BioView. And if I tell you that at this end of the distribution, you have increased risk of myeloid leukemia, where in the distribution do you want to be? It's not here. <laughs> you don't want to be at the other end, because at the other end, you're at high risk for something else. And in fact, when we pull together all of the genes highly significantly associated with acute myeloid leukemia, at the opposite end, there are people that are increased risk for sepsis. So, and it turns out, when I start with sepsis and look, it's really, it's, it's all leukemia and lymphoma, the opposite is sepsis and, and SIRS. If I start with breast cancer, the opposites are diverticulitis and diverticulosis, GI hemorrhage from, from ulcers, um, and cholelithiasis and cholecystitis, so, so inflammation and infection in the bile duct. The opposite of bone cancer is acute bronchitis, bronchiectasis, pulmonary edema post-infection, pulmonary inflammation, and taken as a whole, the opposite of these cancers are like the immune system in overdrive, too much, overreaction. Sepsis is not just a big infection, it's the overreaction of all of those tissues to the insult. It's your kidneys shut down, your lungs shut down, and, and for the, there are plenty of people with the same sort of magnitude of infection that never develop sepsis. So it's really interesting that in different organs, you're seeing the same sort of thing. Um, lots of people have ulcers and never know it. They don't have GI hemorrhage from their ulcers. Most of us have respiratory infections all our lives and never have acute bronchitis, bronchiectasis, pulmonary edema after our respiratory infections. So, th so again, this is it's a, an, uh, raising the question of whether the, the commonality to the, this polygenic risk for cancer is kind of a failure of immune surveillance, immune system not, not quite up to full task. But as we went to the 20,000, yes, we replicate those general ideas, but it's bigger than that. 
there are these major biological axes that genes and diseases are piling up on. I'm going to give you some examples. Um, so top genes affecting risk of kidney failure are characterized as pivots on this axis of innate immunity wound healing and a bunch of different diseases and genes are piling up on that axis along with kidney failure. So a variety of additional phenotypes consistently observed as associated with these same genes and you see the consistency in both directions. So there's certain phenotypes always on the same side with kidney failure and other phenotypes always associated with the opposite end of things. Um, so this is one of the ones characterized as a pivot on this innate immunity wound healing axis. So you see the renal failure not otherwise specified at 1 times 10 to the minus 17, end stage renal disease, 10 to the minus 13, nephritis and nephropathy, acute renal failure, um, renal dialysis, so that's, that's in red. But you see anemias, they're inevitably anemias, and yes, anemias can be a consequence of kidney failure, but I think this is more than that. You see diabetic retinopathy, but other re uh, retinopathies as well, so non-diabetic ret retinopathies, always you see some retinopathy. Um, the uterine leiomyoma and symptoms of uterine leiomyoma um, frequently associated as well. Um, but you see some congenital stuff with all of these two because they have the really big, highly significant associations. They're not Mendelian disease genes, but they might as well be. Actually, this one is a Mendelian disease gene also. Um, gangrene, uh, also notice the substance, and, uh, substance addiction and related disorders. Um, that's a really interesting thing. So far, all of the top genes I've identified for alcoholism, substance addiction and disorders are on this axis. So you wouldn't, I mean, kidney failure usually has the more significant association, but they're on this axis. Um, it's a really interesting thing because the mor morbid obesity, not just obesity, but morbid obesity and bariatric surgery looks like it's on the axis too. Anyways, so again, so another gene, um, also from blood, but it doesn't matter whether the predictors were built in a solid tissue or blood, the pattern's exactly the same. So you get the renal dialysis, end-stage renal disease, renal failure not otherwise specified, cystic kidney disease, hypertensive chronic kidney disease, so the, the things that give rise to kidney failure, type 2 diabetes with renal manifestations. But you also get the bolus dermatitis, you know, skin, skin conditions, congenital anomalies, um, End stage, you know, another one, end stage renal disease, renal failure, type 2 diabetes with renal manifestations. Um, so you see the retinopathies. We also often see glaucoma. And I just wanted to pull in one with some interesting associations that are not on this axis. This is just one of several different axes that we've been able to identify and name because some of the top genes are um, characterized as pivots on the axis. It's, this one was interesting, so this is neuropeptide S receptor 1, because it's, this gene was, has been studied in rats for decades for the fear response, and to see it associated with um, phobia just gave me a kick, so it's, I remember from my psychology classes, um, this, this gene. It had also been already associated with asthma with ac um, exacerbation. It's associated with a number of endocrine things here as well, which I think is you know, potentially interesting, but not all genes are on that, um, on that axis. I pulled ones that are, that are clearly on that axis. And, um, and it's a major axis, don't get me wrong, because um, there are lots of phenotypes on these axes. If I look for the top genes for schizophrenia, many of them are on this axis. More than half, well, 40, 50 percent are on this axis. There are other axes that are just have, that it just have to do with brain biology that schizophrenia is on as well. Um, but you see cardiomyopathies, retinopathy, um, so primary pulmonary hypertension, all, all on one side of this axis. But there are highly significant phenotypes associated always on the other end. So you get some of those benign, relatively benign skin conditions, actinic keratosis, seborrheic keratosis, rosacea, some not so benign melanoma, um, but you get basal cell carcinomas, a bunch of, of neoplasms and dysplasias, um, hypothyroidism, Alzheimer's, and essentially all, all other dementias, um, atrial fibrillation. It has not escaped our notice that the <laughs> I'd rather have these than these, um, but 
But I put this as a, a real axis, a real pivot, because these are just as highly significantly associated at the opposite end as these are. So when you see kidney failure at minus, you know, 10 to the minus 20, um, you're likely to see Alzheimer's or melanoma or rosacea or one of these others at 10 to the minus 20 in the opposite direction. So it's not that you're in sort of health and you can fall into disease. You want to be here in the middle. Um, and these, these are opposite ends of, of a real axis. And, and as long as you're balanced, you're fine, but you get too many of those genes um, with expression in the wrong direction and you fall off of it. And some of the Mendelian diseases are clearly on this axis. They're associated with many of the same phenotypes, but a Mendelian disease gene has, is able all by itself to pull people over into disease. And there are lots of axes. So some that, that we can easily name from results in just the first 20,000 patients include the wound healing and aid immunity, TGF beta signaling, apoptosis and growth, calcium signaling, but there are other signaling pathways in the brain that I'm still trying to figure out. So there are lots of axes. And it's like, it's like back to Aristotle. <laughs> And, and I think offers new ways of thinking about disease and biomarker development for monitoring people as they come off these axes in one direction or the other. If we could develop therapies related to keeping people from sort of, sort of on an even keel and, and not falling over, um, that would be uh, an interesting way to think about drug development. And so um, these are lots of new kinds of ideas. Happy, I really am interested in feedback, but, but these ideas are screaming for some now ENCODE to see all these genes. Remember, we build only cis predictors, and these are uncorrelated. They end up associated with all the same phenotypes because the top things that are associated are different for different ones of them. Sometimes it's the cardiomyopathies that are at the, you know, in the 10 to the minus 20, and, and, and the kidney failure in the 10 to the minus 11, and sometimes it's just the opposite. But it's, and so they're uncorrelated, but it still looks the same because it's like this Chinese menu of sets of phenotypes that are always there on the axes on both sides. Um, so, yeah, so sometimes it's glaucoma and sometimes it's retinopathy and sometimes it's both. Uh, so uncorrelated, but clearly driven by the same biology and, and screaming for ENCODE to get at some of this larger biology. And, of course, this is just, so after QC, this is about 18,000 people that we've got results on. In a few months, we'll have 36,000, and we'll be able to look at it all again, and 72,000, and more than 120,000. So my, my colleagues at Vanderbilt, we were singing a new tune. Um, Eric and Lisa did most of the heavy lifting on analyses and on where it keeps the computers going. Our zebrafish colleagues and BioView is part of our CTSA. Uh, my GTEx colleagues and GTEx is just a, also a fantastic sister project to ENCODE. Thanks. Go ahead with the mic. Okay, um, very interesting work. So I, I have a question. So if you look at all the top hits in all the GWAS studies, like um, cirrhosis, type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and if you do the FIWA study, does the, those uh, treat show up on your list? Yeah, and yeah. Are they show up on the top? Uh, yeah, so, so, um, so like for example, if, you, if, we, if we run type 2 diabetes, <laughs> Uh, as a phenotype, just uh, the ICD-9 codes, you get all the top GWAS hits. If you, if you refine the quality of that phenotype, you get closer estimates to exactly the same odds ratios that you get in GWAS with research quality diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. But the fact is, if you use only the diabetes mellitus code, you get all the same things, because 90% of diabetes is type 2 diabetes. Um, that said, now when we do predict scan analysis on all of the world's data in type 2 diabetes, 
um, we are able to characterize more of the genes that are probably the targets of the GWAS associated SNPs. Um, but there's also a really interesting thing that we see with type 2 diabetes and others um, in very large scale. I think um, some of the very top uh, SNPs from the perspective of effect sizes are often associated with multiple of expression of multiple of the local genes, which may affect more biology, and that may be why we see sort of outlier um, effect sizes for a small number of SNPs with each disease. It, those, those SNPs may be part of the expression, the predicted expression of multiple local genes, potentially in different tissues, that all help to drive the biology of the association that's observed. Um, yes. Hi. So I have a question. Do you actually um, look maybe and identify genes or SNPs which are protective of certain phenotypes? Well, so, you know, the um, people are very interested, drug companies are very interested in rare protective variants, so loss of function mutations associated with reduced risk of disease. Okay, the, the direction of effect of our genetic prediction is getting them the same information in the sense that it's increased predicted expression of most of those genes um, that's associated with kidney failure and all those other bad things. A part of the reason drug companies want that, it's a, it's a sort of a guaranteed gene target, but it also m suggests that down inhibiting that gene or protein is the way to improve health well, because it's so much easier to inhibit a gene or protein than to upregulate it. Now, I, I mean, so when you're in the middle, you just have, um, you have average predicted expression. You have the population average predicted expression and not asso no associations with that, um, with that, the predicted expression of that gene. Um, but when you have too much, that's, that is a good drug target in the sense of it's always easier to drag a gene's expression or a protein's level down than to increase its expression. Yeah. Uh, just two, two very quick questions, uh, Nancy. One is that the, is the um, availability of the data going to be filtered in any way? Does it go to dbGaP or is it total open access? It's number one. Right. So historically, as we've published papers relating to phenotype, those data have gone to dbGaP. Um, that's what Vanderbilt's always done. I, th I think the, um, you know, like the, the database that we want to set up for Mendelian disease genes right away, I mean, even just at, at the 20,000, I think, um, you know, people would probably have to certify that they wouldn't try to re-identify subjects. The, f the good thing is these, uh, gen this genetically predicted endophenotype is based on many SNPs often, even with a, you know, a, a penalized regression sort of approach like elastic net. So going backwards, re-identifying would be much more difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a really deep end product, as it were, results-oriented database. So I think it would be safe, but we'd still have to have certification that it wouldn't be used outside. I mean, you, know, you wouldn't try to re-identify. Right. So just, uh, it's a good segue. So the the mutations that have been associated, as, as you know, GWAS, most of the mutations lie outside the coding regions of, of many of these genes, and many of them lie in the regions of now uh, non-coding RNAs. Are these filtered out of your No, data? no, no. So we have, we have a whole set of non-coding RNAs whose expressions we predict, and that's a really interesting subset of what we characterize as Mendelian genes in waiting. There are some with huge associations to cardiac congenital anomalies and other things. I mean, they totally look like Mendelian disease genes, but they're non long non-coding RNAs and really, really interesting patterns of association associated with their reduced genetically predicted expression. 
Thanks.